Food Lunch and Learn, um, co-hosted by the GROW program and the Cooperative Extension. Um, so the GROW program is a program of Rural CAP, which, is, which stands for uh, Rural Alaska Community Action Program. And it's a nonprofit that was started in the 60s to um, address poverty in Alaska. And um, we currently have uh, programs all over the state um, in housing, education, and wellness programs. So um, the GROW program is stands for uh, Growing Rural Opportunities for Wellness. And um, we uh, provide funding and training and technical assistance to um, rural community gardeners to improve the infrastructure and um, outreach and capacity of the uh, projects that they are already doing. So um, we are really excited to also provide a lunch and learn series as an effort to um, start conversations about gardening in rural Alaska and also connect um, rural Alaska gardeners to each other. Um, Thanks, Iva. Yeah, thank you. And I'm Emily Becker. I'm part of the GROW program, and I am super excited to introduce our four speakers for our discussion today. This is probably my favorite topic, which is compost, because it's like making really valuable stuff out of stuff that you would normally throw away. Um, and we have our just great speakers today. We have Jody Anderson. She's from the UAF Institute of Agriculture, Natural Resources and Extension, and lots of other things. Also a soil scientist. And she's going to give us like a kind of an intro to composting. And then we have Gatiera Haik from Metlakatla. She's going to do kind of our case study of how she composts um, there with her program. Then we have Heidi Rader from uh, UAF. She's the Tanana Chiefs Cooperative Extension Agent. And she's also a teacher of the Statewide Master Gardener Program. She's going to answer, if you have like uh, some questions that you want to ask about, you know, composting in rural Alaska, she's kind of going to do our Q&A. And then we have uh, Amanda Jedlicky, and she's actually one of Heidi's students um, who's earning her, her um, Master Gardener Certificate uh, with you know, she's doing a volunteer, her volunteer hours, and she's going to tell us about worm farming in winter, something that anybody can do statewide in Alaska. So without further ado, um, I will turn it over to Jody. And of course, you know, as we're talking, please feel free to put questions in the chat, and we hope we can get to them. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emily and Rural Cap, for the invitation to be here. Um, there really isn't too many, there aren't too many things that I enjoy more than talking about uh, compost. So I'm really stoked uh, to be with you guys today. Um, I'm going to start my timer for myself so I don't go too much. And uh, um, <clears throat> so it, Emily already told you that really composting is taking that cold pile of goo and turning it into something really awesome. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I have to tell you, that composting is about 10% science and 90% art, in all honesty. And what I'm going to give you today in 15 minutes or less is that 10% science. It's going to be short and sweet. And I'm going to just say lots of words and you're going to have questions and that's okay. Um, so write your questions down, type them in the chat immediately. Let us know what's up. Um, I probably won't be able to pay attention to the chat box, but you guys are welcome to throw um, con uh, concepts in the chat and questions that you have uh, as we move forward. And um, let's get into some science. You guys are gonna be nerds for just a little while with me. And it's easy, super easy. Here's the real deal about composting. When you compost, you're actually a zookeeper. <laughs> That's really what it's all about. So the really awesome thing about composting is that you are feeding the, the bugs, and I'm going to use air quotes, bugs, and then now from this point forward, I'm not going to use air quotes around bugs anymore, but I probably will because I talk with my hands. But when I say bugs, what I'm referring to are bacteria and nitrogen, or bacteria and fungi. 
So bacteria and fungi are really the workers in a compost pile. And as the composter, you are the zookeeper. You are giving these bugs what they need to do their job. Composting is a natural biological um, process. It happens across the face of this great earth. It's in a very thin layer all over the earth. It's called decomposition. It's a natural biological process. But as humans, as you well know, we want to do things better, faster, stronger, all the things. So what have we done? We have made piles and created these intensified decomposition uh, processes, which is really weird to say. And you don't want to talk about those piles in your backyard because that's weird. So instead, we call it composting, which is easy. Composting is all about making sure your bacteria and your fungi have everything they need to do their job, which is to break down all of this material for you and to leave good things behind, right? So that's it's a win-win. You get rid of waste and you get good things to use in the end. So it's a win-win process. So normally, as we talk about the science behind this, what do you need to to feed a living organism, well, that's pretty easy. All living organisms, except for a few at the bottom of the ocean, but we're not gonna talk about them. All living organisms live on carbon. So carbon, you have to give them carbon. They have to have carbon. So carbon is a huge component of your pile. In fact, it's such a huge component, you need three parts carbon in your recipe. And you only need four things in your recipe. So super easy. You need three parts carbon because all living things, especially the living critters that we're going to be working with in our pile as the zookeeper, they need carbon. Carbon is what gives us the, it, it's our energy. Carbon breaks down and allows us, all of our cells, whether it's multi-celled like us or whether it's single-celled like bacteria and fungi, that is where they get their energy is breaking down that carbon. They break down that carbon in the presence of oxygen because they're called, they're called aerate, right? They're, they're aerated, they're oxygenated, they're aerobic. I'm using lots of air, air, right? So aerobic means in the presence of oxygen. And these critters that we want in our pile need oxygen. So you've got three parts carbon and you've got oxygen. The oxygen is going to help break down that carbon to form energy. So the little dudes can do their job, and that's awesome. But now they need to expand. Now they need to grow. Now they need to build structure within themselves. They have to have nitrogen. So three parts carbon, one part nitrogen. Oxygen, I don't have a hand for that one. And I'm not going to show you my foot. And water. That's it. You need three parts carbon, one part nitrogen, oxygen, and water. Well, that's it. So I hope you guys have fun. Good luck. Oh, I'm just kidding. We'll talk a little bit more details. So Jody, what are you talking about? I mean, I get that question a lot, as you can well imagine. But those of you who compost and those of you who are cool, who have researched compost, may have heard these concepts of brown and green, these two words, right? So browns are, what we're talking about are feedstock. Feedstock is what you build your pile out of. So for many of us, our piles are built out of waste materials, scrap materials, things that we don't need anymore. We need three parts carbon, remember, in our compost pile to make our bugs happy. So that means we need three parts of brown things. Brown meaning carbon rich. Doesn't have to be brown in color. Don't worry about the color of things. That's confusing, sort of. Brown is what you're looking for. So those who live in areas where you have lawns that you mow, dried mowed grass, that's a brown. Um, those who live in areas where there are leaves to be raked off trees in the fall time, dry leaves work really well. Those who live in areas who have trees, dry branches, little thin little branches, twigs work great. 
those who live in areas where we don't have those things, where we don't have lawns, we don't have leaves and trees, and there's a lot of those areas in Alaska, shredded paper, newspaper, cardboard, those are all carbon rich feedstocks that can be used for your compost pile. Um, there's some weird things, right? Like notice like dryer lint. Yeah, I know it's creepy, but it works. And depending on how much hair is in your dryer lint, if there's a lot of like animal pet hair, I don't mean like your personal hair, but maybe you're having a, a thing, I don't know. But dryer lint, if it's very hairy, um, it can actually be a nitrogen source. Hair, cut hair, give a friend who cuts hair, have them give you scraps of cut hair. That is actually a nitrogen source. So that's the green stuff. So remember, if, you, if you're looking at this three parts, and Jody, you keep saying parts, you keep saying parts. What about, that's not a recipe. It is a recipe because some of you are gonna build a compost pile based on buckets because that's as much as you've got. And some of you may have huge resources. So you're gonna use truckloads. Some of you may use wheelbarrows full. Whatever the thing is that you're measuring, you need three of those filled with carbon and one of those with nitrogen. That's what I mean when I'm talking about the parts. So you got three parts carbon. So get your stuff together, gather it together before you build your pile. Don't assume, well, I've only got two and a half parts of carbon and kind of almost one whole part of nitrogen. I'll go ahead and build my pile and add to it. Mistake. Have everything on hand. Go ahead and build your pile. When you build your pile up, start at the bottom with carbon, cover it with a little bit of nitrogen, and then just layer it. Don't be like my friend who said, Jody, when I turn my pile, how do I keep the layers separate? Bless her heart. Yes, I actually had a friend who asked me the question. I'm sorry. Things are breaking down in that pile so fast that when you go to turn it, you won't notice the layers after the first turn. It's awesome. Green things. One of the best and most used green things in our state because it's a resource and it's a huge waste product and every community has it. Check your school, check your, your health um, aid office, whatever it is. Check your churches, check your cafes. Coffee grounds, right? Coffee grounds are everywhere. They're waste. Everyone's like, ew, chuck it. Don't chuck it. Save those coffee grounds. They're a great nitrogen source. So there's your one part. So if you're collecting buckets, you got a bucket full of coffee grounds and then three buckets full of some carbon pieces. So you build your pile up outside, don't do it inside. Build it up, layer, water it in between your layers. And then when it's time to turn it, I'm gonna show you guys this. Are you ready? Here we go, nerding out, there it is. I know everybody loves the nerdness. Here's the thing. You are gonna turn your pile based on temperature and your temperature of your pile is based on the activity of the bugs inside your pile. If the bugs run out of food, they slow down and your pile cools off. If the bugs don't have enough water, they slow down and it, your pile cools off. If your bugs don't have enough anything, they slow down. I think you're, you're picking up the trend that I'm laying down here. Temperature of your pile is dependent on the pile itself. I've had people who said, Jody, I just bought a compost turner, put it in my backyard. Good for you. It's black. It'll absorb the sun. It's going to get warm. I'm going to have great compost. No, you won't. What? It has nothing to do with the sun, you guys. It's all about the pile. That pile creates its own heat. If you don't believe me, put a very small child who can walk or crawl really, really fast in a small room and give them lots and lots of sugar. Carbon. 
and let them just move around in that room and then bring 10 other children just like them and then throw in a couple of puppies. And all of a sudden the room has just all this activity and there's literally steam coming out of the windows of that room. There's so much energy. That's exactly what your compost pile is doing. They're like little kids on sugar with puppies. They're just going nuts inside that pile so much so that you're creating heat. And if you look at this graph, it, you see that heat go up and then it starts to crash just like tiny children do, right? And as soon as it starts to crash, the temperature starts to drop. That's when you turn your pile. So every time there's an arrow on my nerd page here, that's when you turn it. Notice at the beginning, it's really quick. There's lots of food, there's lots of water, there's lots of oxygen. These guys are going nuts. And then slowly over time, it takes a while. Now, if you're an amazing composter, you are taking this thing's temperature every day. And as soon as you watch the trend, it goes up, 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 and it starts to drop, that's when you turn your pile. This composter here that's represented in this graph waited quite a while, like life got in the way, right? Oh, it's fishing season. I'm gonna go down and dip net for a while. Oh, I should turn my pile, but now it's moose season. I gotta go get a moose, fill my freezer. Life happens. It's okay. Compost piles are the best. It's not like a green plant in your office or in your house or even growing in your garden. A compost pile, it'll wait for you. When it when it's, doesn't have any more food, it stops. You can wake it up again and it'll start right back up again. Thanks so much for giving me more food. I'm gonna keep going. You do that by turning your pile. By turning your pile, you're also bringing in oxygen. When you turn your pile, you water it. All those things happen and you end up with a workable pile. At the end, your temperature won't change. Your composting is done. The tighter you babysit your pile and the more frequently you turn it when that temperature barely starts to drop, the faster your composting time will be. Once it's finished composting, you don't put it directly in your garden, however. You have to let it cure. And that is usually where most people yell at me and throw tantrums because they spent all this time on a compost pile and now they can't use it yet. But by letting it cure, you're allowing all of the good benefits of a compost pile to start compiling and then you use it next year in your garden, in your flower beds, and then it becomes a magical thing. So really quickly, I just wanna show you these pictures. The one on the left side is, is a composter vessel that I created thanks to Rubbermaid. Um, it's a 33 and a half or 33 and a third gallon trash can. And I built this because I wanted to make a composter that we could get the materials anywhere, anywhere. And so I, I just used three quarter inch hole, cut them every four inches, also on the lid. This is a really nice composter. I got great compost out of it. And to turn it, I just dump it onto a tarp, water it, toss it around, throw it back in the bucket, put the lid on it. My time's up. I hope everybody gets, if you have questions, please make sure to answer it. I never give these talks this short a time, but Emily, for you, you know me, I'll do it. Thanks, Jody. that was awesome. Um, so I, I guess one question I have before, before we go to the next speaker is, um, what happens if you don't let it cure? Is it terrible? It isn't terrible, but what you're gonna do is you're gonna, you're gonna, you're not going to get all the benefits of your of the compost itself. So one of the really cool benefits of compost in the long run, right, is, is after a cured compost, is you're letting the fungi come in. I didn't even get to talk about marathon runners and sprinters, but that's okay, another class sometime. But the deal is, is that when you allow the fungus to come in and actually start, they're, they're your marathon runners, breaking down that pile in the curing phase, 
what ends up happening is you're starting to get those benefits of fungi. So you're getting antibiotic benefits that can come from having fungi in it that are actually going to fight off and kill the bad bacteria that might be in the soil. So there's a whole bunch of little beneficials that that's composting 301 that we'll do someday, right? But that's the sort of stuff that you're looking for in that curing process. Just to let you know, in Europe, you are not allowed to sell a compost until it's at least cured for one year. Hmm. Cool. Thanks, Jody. Um, and our next speaker um, is going to tell us sort of how she does it in practice. So get Geta um, from Metlakatla. Neat. Got Geta DYU. Let's keep to take you. Metlakatla D will walk you. Metlakatla D will suck you. Hello, my name is Got Geta Hike. Let's Eagle Clan is where I'm the clan I'm from. Matlakatla is where I live, and Matlakatla is where I'm from. I've been working at the community, the Sitten Doyetkum Geltzup Community Garden here in Matlakatla for about five to six years now, and have been creating and developing a composting program for about three to four years. Um, I'm not as a uh, pro as Jody is. I'm kind of uh, started it, just winging it, learning along the process. Uh, I was new to composting when I started. Uh, when we, when I first started at the garden, we only had peat moss, and so I didn't really wasn't producing any food well, and it wasn't nutritious, and there was no funding to get to buy soil or purchase compost because, as we all know, in Alaska, compost is incredibly in expensive. So I started, uh, it was around Halloween time. I started just saying to everybody, hey, once you're done with your pumpkins, I will take your pumpkins. And I just put out a plastic tote by the beginning of the, uh, by the sign by the community garden said, please, I will take your pumpkins. Uh, and that's how it all started. And, um, you know, I just, it took a lot over the years of community outreach. Now I'm averaging about 500 pounds a month and that's only just from the school districts, our local mini mart where I do also get coffee grounds every other day, which helps my compost heap tremendously. I get their kitchen food scraps. Um, and it's pretty cool to see every year and even, even this year, more and more people are willing to donate to the compost pile. And one of the things of why I also wanted to start it is because it lessens the burden on our landfill. Because now over the last five years, now we have two landfills. And it's, you know, this waste problem is just getting out of control in my community. And to fill a need, and put that food waste to better use and help improve the soil health at the garden. Um, you know, I started this composting program and I'm on the verge of launching a community-wide composting program, which I'm really excited to do. Um, and to be able to get to this point, I have, because I didn't know anything of composting and I was just winging it, like I started with just a hole in the ground. Um, I've tried to be resourceful. I've used untreated wood pallets that were donated from the community and built compost bins. And then it's turned to stalls. Like every year I would make modifications to the compost pile because I would learn more and more over the years that I do it. I've also taken old tires from the landfill and from donations from the community and use that for a compost pile because back before COVID from the school district, I got mounds and mounds of compost from their kitchen scraps and their food waste. So that was a whole new, so, and I didn't have funding. So I was just like, I need to figure it out and have this big pile and this heap and to help create the heat for here in Southeast Alaska, I use tires and a pla old plastic cover to cover it 
and kept turning that, which wasn't fun, but you know, I <laughs> needed to be done because you got to turn it. Um, and then last year I started seeking funding and through Spruce Root Food Catalyst Program, I was able to purchase scales so I could start monitoring the amount of compost that I'm collecting. I want to be able to collect for a year and take it to my tribal council and be like, look, this is how much food waste we are collecting. This is how much volume we are diverting from the landfill and repurposing in the community to create one, a self-sustaining program and two, grow food for the community that is healthy, nutritious and locally grown 100%. And, and um, how I lost my train of thought. And so, and then I also applied for a, to a native corporation called Naha Ilahi um, for more funding and my compost pile, I received a grant from them and my compost will now finally be able to have a home of its own because over the years, it's just been moved around my, my garden site just due to limited space. But with this funding, I'm able to create its own space, finally give it a home, finally have its own little building where I can have its own little composting process that's gonna happen. Um, and I'm just now, as Jody mentioned with the fungi, I'm able with the last bit of the funding gonna be purchasing mushrooms to finally cure the compost, which I'm really excited to making that journey because I haven't really been able to officially cure our compost pile, but it really did make a difference in the garden last year. Just seeing, you know, each bed was just flourishing with food and greenery. It was so beautiful and it was really got caught the eye in the community because half of the food that I grow, I donate to the elders of the community. And so, and I'm very, I put it all over Facebook for everybody to see like, hey, if you see me come up, you know, take a look, have a walk around. And it really did make a difference in the community garden this year. So, and, and that's, you know, composting has become such a huge passion of mine because I see the fruits that it can produce. And for my community to be self-sustaining people, we have to start rethinking our trash. I have a question. Um, so do you, um, do you go out and collect it or do they bring it to you? So I am, we have, I do both. I do for the local businesses, I go out about every other day and collect. Um, and then I also do have from the spruce root funds, I was able to build a drop off bin. So community members are able to go and drop off. Um, I haven't been able to add their totals of donations into my total because my scale, I don't have electricity just yet at the community garden. So, um, so just whatever I pick up, I'm able to weigh and scale and keep track. But uh, it's been really interesting to see this, you know, my sister calls it a pile of trash, but I'm like, it's more than trash. <laughs> but, you know, this pile of food waste just, it just boggles my mind because once I have this community-wide program running, I'm like, it's going to be so much food waste, but it's going to be so much black gold. Awesome. And, and you, um, you also use fish waste. Can you tell us about that too? Um, actually this year, this winter was our first venture down fish waste, um, composting, and it's still, still working right now. We just got the old cannery fish totes and filled it, filled it about half with fish and then half with seaweed. And then now, now that everything is unthawed, I'm starting to incorporate my main compost, 
pile and start turning it into the fish composting totes. And do you have problems with animals for that? Um, we've just mainly dogs, but we keep it pretty covered. I mean, yeah, on those pretty warm days when it does thaw, it gets a little stinky, but um, yeah, that's also kind of the name of the game, I guess, in the beginning until you start really have that your science of your pile down. When I started, uh, you know, Jody mentioned to have your stuff ready. It, I didn't have my stuff ready. <laughs> so I was just, it was all mainly food waste. Now I kindly, I have, you know, a better understanding of, okay, I've got this much food waste. I need this much newspaper. I really had to or outsource in the community for newspaper, for wood shavings, from carvers. I really had to start thinking out of the box. I have seaweed, but also, you know, that's, that's also organic. You know, I needed more. I egg cartons. I really put flyers all around the community with the whole list. I needed eggshells. I need more coffee grounds and just really relied on the community to meet most of my brown needs because I didn't want to go around the community collecting all the dead leaves because also you have those are you know homes for bugs over the winter so. Thank you. So Gatgeta is in Metlakat, obviously, and I know um, uh, we have diff people on this um, call from all over. And um, Heidi Rader is actually here to answer questions from people in different places in, in rural Alaska. So if you have um, a specific question about where you live, you know, she reaches people all over the state with her Master Gardener program and, is, and has worked all around Alaska. So are there, if you have any uh, any questions, you can either, you know, put your hand up. Actually, I think we're probably a small enough group. If you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, you can do that as well. Um, so welcome, Heidi. Thank you. Hi, everyone. And great presentation, Scott Geta and Jody too. Um, I did want to drop a link in the chat, too, to a composting calculator. and. It's, you know, as Jody said, it's part science, part art, but it gives you an idea of things like sawdust are particularly high in carbon and things like fish waste are really high in nitrogen. So uh, that kind of spits out all kinds of different recipes depending on whatever components you have. And I have a question, Heidi, tell us about wood chips. Like, you know, uh, what's the danger in too many wood chips? Well, wood chips are very high in carbon. And so if you don't compensate equally with, uh, you know, the high nitrogen components or a, if you don't have a, a recipe, that's where you can get into trouble. And what, how that would impact your garden if you, say, added sawdust directly to your garden or wood chips. Um, it's, you know, you're going to tie up a lot of fertilizer if you uh, have that in your garden or a very high carbon compost. So that's why a composting calculator could be pretty helpful. Um, and I do see a question in the chat, and I'll do my best to answer these, but if anyone else has a good answer too, feel free. Uh, does the high iron content North Pole well water affect composting? The same for softened water and sodium content. Ooh, that, that's going to be a bit beyond my technical expertise, I would have to say. Um, I don't know. Anybody else? Jody. Yeah, um, it's a great question. Um, the iron is uh, the iron in your water and your soft water are not going to affect your pile. Um, where what what may happen, it, especially if you have very acidic soils that you're moving your compost into later, you can actually mobilize iron, meaning iron can move through your soil um, and could possibly affect your plants if you have a um, if you have a very very high iron compost um, because in very acidic soils iron is mobile. So. 
that's the only the only thing that could possibly happen and even that is probably not really going to be a problem so i would say that um, a high mineral content in your waters whether it be you know hard water or soft water side um, you're going to be you're going to be good Thanks, Jody. Uh, and I will try to tackle this next question. Will using diatomaceous earth affect compost? Um, diatomaceous earth is used to kill things like slugs and some other pests as well, uh, like root maggots. And so you, you may impact some of the insects and critters that are in your compost pile by using diatomaceous earth. And um, I don't know how expensive it is, but I would imagine that you wouldn't want to just dump it into your compost pile. I know, you know, there's various recipes out there that call for adding fertilizer to your compost. And again, it's kind of a waste in some ways because you might lose some of those nutrients with, with water leaching out and things like that. Yeah. Heidi, can I just really quickly? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, so because it is actually just like a, a fine powdered silt, or sorry, clay that is um, is that substance, um, you're going to actually end up locking up some of the nutrients that you would ultimately want your compost to release later, um, and it would be locked up for quite some time. So, I wouldn't. Highly, I wouldn't highly recommend adding it. Plus, there's not a lot of purpose to add it. Um, it would be better for you to um, add that directly into soil. If you're having problems with um, your your nutrient loss, but I wouldn't add it into a compost pile. And it looks like we have a comment. Uh, we have been bringing back lots of fish, which is great. And, you know, if, if you're not going fishing, asking people for their fish scraps, that's a great way to go too. Pretty stinky though, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I just, and, yeah, I was just okay. asking Delia, so what, um, what do you do with your, um, fish waste when you bring it back? Well, um, we put it um, in our compost pile and we um, put um, leaves that we saved from the fall before over it. Um, two years ago, we um, didn't mix it in as well and cover it as well. And we had root mat, or we had uh, maggots everywhere. And they were not just um, in the pile, they were kind of extended they're they're connected to the garden and it's like oh my gosh i don't want to walk over maggots but the following this last year it wasn't a big issue but so maggots are the big thing and the ride back from the kenai was like a one a big road trip it was pretty quick uh well, not quick but um we didn't have to smell it but yeah it's it's a waste it seems like a waste to have all that those beautiful fish carcasses um, go into the river or into garbage containers. Um, so yeah, it's a good use of it. Yeah, doing it in the winter, if you can. I know I, I did a YouTube video with some farmers down in Homer and they go down to the docks and collect the fish waste in the winter to cut down on the smell and root maggots and things like that. And you certainly can compost in the winter um, if you have a big enough pile in some of the warmer areas of Alaska, especially if you get the large, large volume size of the pile and then things like fish will really heat it up. So doing that, at least in the shoulder season is probably a good idea. Yes, I, I think the post stock cooked carcasses and I've done that before to make stock with some of the carcasses and then at that point, dump it into the, the compost pile afterwards. That's like a super duper good uh, way to reduce food waste because you're kind of upcycling it a couple times. <laughs> and just a quick mention to food waste is becoming a huge 
focus um, environmentally. And so if you're involved with community projects, there's, I would keep your eye out for funding sources for food waste and community composting operations too. Let's see, ooh, a bunch of questions. So Laura had a question. Please elaborate on air temperature issues for composting effectiveness, especially starting one in the spring. So, I mean, and, and Jody, you might have a feedback on this, but if you, it's basically going to freeze or it will be active. So um, if your pile is frozen, it's not going to be composting, but what I do is I just add to the pile all winter long. It thaws out in the spring and then it starts composting. And so you can certainly add those components, layer it up, and then at some po point it will begin composting, um, depending on where you live. Has anyone done the fish emulsion with buckets and water? So, I haven't personally done that, but Tim Myers does that a lot. And, you know, I think, again, there's going to be different recipes out there. It's going to be super, super stinky. Um, but if you can handle that, then I think that's a, that's a great way to go. And um, you are probably going to attract some animals with that type of emulsion going. Jody, do you have anything to add? I think you've done research on that with Ming Chu, maybe. Um, okay. Not uh, just that was more fish composting than actually emulsions. Um, so em the emulsions do be careful with that because that is a food safety issue. Um, because they're uh, if you're if you don't bubble it well enough, if there's not enough oxygenation constantly moving through it, so that the aerobic bugs, like the ones who like oxygen, are getting what they need to break it down you're gonna actually end up with a, a potential situation with um, bacteria that are not healthy. And then be careful how you put that on your plants as well. So there are a lot of steps to that fish emulsion to make it safe for human consumption. You know, like you don't wanna splash that on your lettuce and then walk in and eat lettuce for salad. So just be, be careful and know that there's some potentially dangerous um, uh, opportunities if it's not done properly. Well, thanks, Jody. Um, we um, will we'll still have time for questions, I think, but we do want to have um, our last speaker. And thanks, Amanda. Um, we're ready to hear from learning from you about worms and keeping worms in winter, which I think um, is a great way for winter composting. Never done this before, so here we go. Bear with me. I've got vermicomposting or vermiculture, depending on how you'd like to say it. It's basically the same thing. So it's composting with worms. So everything that Jody had talked about, about composting, you just do it on a small scale in a tote with worms. And it's amazing. There are some differences, like you don't want to put meat, you wouldn't put your fish in there. You don't want to put a lot of starchy stuff and I mean, there's some do's and don'ts with that, but um, basically that's to keep from attracting bugs and smell. Everything else can go in there, like your dryer lens, your um, vacuum cleaner, um, collectings, and if you sweep, you know, your dustpan, your hairbrush, um, food scraps, there's all kinds of things you wanna put, you can put in there if you want. Why she's worm composting? It's cheap and easy to set up. Can be kept inside for year-round composting. It's fast and easy disposal of kitchen waste unless you have a lot of kitchen waste. And then you're either going to have a lot of totes full of worms or you need to have a second option for the excess. That, that could go to an outdoor compost pile or to chickens if you have them, but you don't want to overfeed worms. Um, and the best thing about doing the indoor worm composting is the worms do all the work for you. They're turning, they're eating, they're processing stuff, and it's warming up while they're working and things are composting. So you're getting a compost that you can use 
faster and in the winter time. So you can pull that out, all those castings, and use them for seed starting if you want. So it's convenient access to warm castings for early seed starting. So I actually have this going right now in my house, these pictures of these plants. Uh, it's um, my herbs I started with my castings from my worm farm and some green onions we had got from the store and my husband had cut off and used and saved the roots. So we planted those in some and those are growing really well in it. These are worm eggs right there in that picture. So you can see what those look like for people who wander and when they're out and about looking around. Those are worm eggs or if you're in your compost bin digging. Um, they start off as golden yellow and then they turn more red as they age and get ready to hatch. So this is best worms for composting. There is a difference in worms. The red wriggler is the United States most favorite worm for composting. It is from um, a type of worm that I, I cannot even begin to try to pronounce that and I'm not going to slaughter it, so I'm not going to. So it's right there, the Latin word for red wriggler. But they eat the decaying matter at or near the soil surface. Earthworms, the ones you're always finding in your garden and probably would be tempted to bring in to compost, those aren't the same type of worm. They're not going to compost for you like a red wriggler will. They like to eat things that are basically already broken down and composted in the soil. And they are great for your garden, very beneficial. However, they're more for aerating your garden than they are for composting. So they both have two different jobs to do. So the red wriggler is a surface dweller, eats decaying matter at or near soil surface, and loves heat, such as in compost. So the earthworm tunnels up to six feet, loosens and aerates your soil, eats already composted soil deep underground and does not like heat. So it will dive deeper to escape the heat, which means he's either gonna try to escape your bin at all costs, or he's gonna go all the way to the bottom and probably just sit down there and die because he doesn't like it and he's too hot. So their superpowers, Red Wriggler is great at composting, takes off kitchen scraps, garden waste, turns into usable compost. Earthworms have their value. They're great for digging those tunnels and aerating your garden. You can purchase worms from your local feed store, your local garden store, or online. I got mine at Uncle Jim's online, and they have great resources. This is also, on this one, their worm factory tower. I have two of these. Um, my husband had bought one for me years ago, and then someone gave us one. And I don't like them but that's me. They might work great for someone else, but for me, it's, it takes a lot more managing, more time, you gotta watch them more, and you can't put near as much in those trays as you can in my tote over here. This is what I have. I have just a Rubbermaid tote that I cut a hole in the lid and put screen in and put my bedding and my worms in, and I feed my worms in there. It's I'm half full right now. It's full. But the worm factory, I mean, seriously, it's, it's you don't you can't put much in there. And I was always getting bugs that didn't belong, like um, fruit flies, because with it being so restricted of a space for the food, you couldn't really cover the food scraps as well. So it attracted more bugs to my compost bin than I wanted. So um, it does have the handy little spigot, the tower does, but I never had a moisture problem where the juice would drain down and out. What I had though was a lot of worms hiding down in that bin where there's no food and drying out and dying. Where you're supposed to, the idea with the tower is to add on a layer of food. And when the worms are done in the bottom layer, with what they have to break down their food there, they crawl up through the holes in the bottom of the tray and you can go to that new food and start composting that. And you could take that bottom tray out and use that for your compost. I had a lot of issues with this. To me, it didn't make sense. So if my worms are crawling up, then their eggs aren't crawling up with them and you're getting rid of their eggs. But also it's an ecosystem. Your worm farm is an ecosystem, just like your compost 
been with your fungus and your bacteria and all that wonderful stuff that makes it break down and do its thing. If you're constantly taking that away, it's constantly starting over. And to me, that means that it's not as efficient and it's going to take longer. And I kind of feel like eventually, don't you run out of worms or something? They're not reproducing. I mean, yeah, maybe like not, but I was never even able to get them to finish a tray and move up out of that tray successfully. And I got bugs and my worms would leave and it was a pain in the butt. So I tried it two different times after I used the toad over here with the lid. I tried that first, um, well, second, you know, for a long time and got comfortable with that. And then I went back and tried the tower again because, you know, I know more now. Maybe I can make this work. No, I don't recommend the worm factory. If you're like me and you just want to throw your stuff in the bin, not have to worry about it, and, you know, then the tote really is the best. The worm factory. Yeah, I think it would be great for a single person living in a really small apartment in a city somewhere, but the worm farm with the tote is really the best. Um, it's not as pretty. It takes up a little more space. You can do a smaller tote. Size isn't really a thing. You can do smaller or you can do larger. Um, the worms, from what I've read, do not, and I could be wrong, but this is what I've read, is that they do not um, reproduce more than they have space for. Um, let's see, what else do I have here? So and setting up your form farm. Wanna, um, yes, ma'am. Uh, I want to make sure we have time for questions. So I know I can see you have a bunch of slides. Um, I would say if you could focus in um, maybe on the indoor part, because that's where people usually fail, like me. Yeah. <laughs> so it is indoor. Um, they're picky about their um, environment to a point, only to the points where you get them established. When you first get them, you just have to get them established. And it's not hard to do. It's really pretty easy. You just put them in the bin with their, their bedding, which is usually um, coconut core, shredded paper, and things like that. You can go ahead and throw some dirt in there for them if you want. Give them their food. Put a light over them to keep them from crawling out. And they'll stay in there, and they'll start working. And once, after a few days, they're established, they're good to go. And basically, you don't hardly have to do anything. Um, they eat vegetable scraps and all kinds of different things. You don't want to put pet waste, um, too much starch, citrus fruits, plastics, insecticide, covered plants. Um, so mold is can be an issue from excessive moisture. So they like to have their stuff wet, but not sopping wet. So if it, you do end up too wet, you can just add paper and it dries it. Smell, if you have issues with smell, then you just bury all your feed inside the bedding and then skip a feeding or two to let the worms eat everything. Um, sometimes there are bugs, they can draw fruit flies, but usually that's only if you're not covering the food in the bin. I really have it that you do get other bugs in your bin, but you know, it's an ecosystem and usually that's just fine and it's good. Mites is the most common and that's not a bad thing. They're not the same as what you would find on your plants in your house that kill them that you want to kill all the time. These are usually not predatory mites, so they don't normally harm your worms and they help break down stuff. It's all an ecosystem. If you have an overabundance of one thing, then you have to adjust your pH or your moisture or whatever. And that's easy. All you have to do is check to see what your moisture levels are and adjust that. They like it damp, not sopping wet, not dry. Um, pH, you know, just keep a neutral, balanced, pH, which I don't ever test pH. I just think, okay, so I've added a lot of coffee scraps this week. My husband's been home going through coffee grounds like crazy. And now I have mites, a lot of them. So then I just quit putting the coffee scraps in for a little bit and add um, carbon stuff, you know, just to try to lower the eggshells is great for balancing that. You can take your eggshells and powder them up, put them in there. Um, what else? So there are different bugs that people are like, oh, I don't want to see those in there. Springtails are a nuisance for your garden, but they're great actually for your compost. It's, I would try to kill them right away myself. There's 
tons of different ways to handle all the little pests that crawl in there. And it's, it's really pretty easy. A lot of it is just adjusting that ecosystem. Like Jody was saying, you're the zookeeper and these are your critters. Well, it's not just worms. It's, it's other bugs. And a lot of that comes in from stuff from outside. If you bring in anything like leaves from outside, you're going to most likely end up with another bug inside of your, your bin. You can keep it clean by using just uh, fruits and vegetables in your house that you bring in from groceries. You know, you can wash them before you have to put them in there. Freezing your food scraps is a great way to help kill the eggs on most bugs. And it starts to break down process of the food. So it makes it easier for your worms to digest. I stick all mine in a blender and process it down. And that actually, that helps keep the moisture. So I don't have to add water to their bedding, but also um, it, the breakdown process because worms have teeny tiny little mouths and can't eat big chunks like we can. So it helps with the bugs and the worms to break everything down. Questions? I've got lots of slides, <laughs> but I think Amanda, that's an, like that slide right there is super amazing. Um, and in fact, there's a, maybe you and I can connect afterwards. Cause I think some people would like to have a copy of your slides if you yes. don't mind. So I was working on putting them onto a PDF format so I could share it easier. And I didn't quite finish that, but I, and that one has more links to different places too. So if you have issues with like the blowflies, it's specifically for that. So, um, anyways, because I when I started, there wasn't a lot on it, and now there's a lot of resources, so it's great. Yeah, and I, I'm looking back through the chat here, um, and Heidi, you mentioned what's your your mm -hmm. word of caution on red red wrigglers? I, I guess the word of caution would be um, if you can't ideally keep them in a tote and try not to introduce them into the mm -hmm. environment. Um, that's, I loaded a presentation about that. Um, they are being intru introduced. We do have invasive species. Um, there are some benefits, of course, to having them in your garden, but definitely a some downsides too. So just be aware of that. And, and it is ideal, you know, it's like goldfish or endolodia. Um, if you can keep the non-native species in a contained environment, that's ideal. So, Which is really easy because you really don't want to throw your worms outside unless you're just done with them, right? So you don't, you pick them out of your castings, you know, you don't, you don't harvest those. You leave them in your bin and you just use castings that don't have your worms in them. And I take my castings and I actually cook them. I think it's like 175 for 20 mm -hmm. minutes or so, just because I don't want to risk any of those bugs transferring over to my plants. And it's not enough to kill all the nutrients in the soil. It's enough to neutralize some nutrients, but not all of them. And it helps to kill the bugs. You can also freeze it and help do that. And that way also, I mean, there's your, I go through and pick out the worm eggs. You can tell what they are because they're nice little yellow pearls. Wow. And put them all back that in my sounds like bin. a lot of work. So, <laughs> it's not bad. And I love my worms. So I have fun. I go through and turn it like I would a compost bin on occasion, just so that the moisture is even through it. And they seem to do much better after that than if I just leave it. So if your worms leave your bin, they're not happy. Check their ecosystem. Something's off. Um, otherwise, they're awesome and easy. So... Um, your passion for this is really obvious, Amanda. Uh, can you um, stop your screen? And uh, there were actually a couple yeah. other questions. Uh, stop screen sharing. Um, one really quick one. What temperature is ideal for a worm bin? Um, shoot, how do I stop this now? You got it. We're good. Did I? Okay. Um, so the temperature is right around 75 degrees, I believe. It's in my... Up? long thing <laughs> can they're they actually near my heater they oh. can live in a garage they can they're not going to um the colder they are the less active they'll be they might go dormant if it's too cold or they might try to leave all together so you just watch your worms and adjust for them 
I moved mine around my house three different times before I found a spot they liked. And it's by my heater in my kitchen. Sounds hot, but it's not because it's also by my front door. So it catches a draft a lot because there's always someone in and out. <laughs> Um, it's awesome. This your your enthusiasm is really inspiring, and I um, uh, people have requested your slides. So maybe you, if you and I can stay sure. afterwards, that'd be awesome. Um, and then uh, Laura requested a preview of upcoming um, topics. So our next one is it's every two weeks. Our next one is March first: How to apply for high tunnel funding. Um, March fifteenth will be how to host a seed starting workshop in your community. March 29th is going to be incorporating a community garden into your food pantry. Um, April 12th is forming a food security task force. Um, April 26th, uh, efficiency pro tips for running a greenhouse. We'll have Heidi back for that one. And our last one is May 10th, uh, responsible foraging. And I'll post all those topics over on our Facebook page. Um, so, and it's the GROW program. You can find us there. Oh, thanks, Gina. She's posting it in the chat. Um, yes, so um, we can, you know, stay on. I'm going to stop recording here, I think. So thank you, everyone.